Ireland has long been shrouded in mystery and folklore. To the ancient Romans, it was even more remote than distant Britannia, visited only by a small number of merchants and having very limited, if any, military presence. After the arrival of Christianity around the early 5th century, tales became legends, such as those spun by or about bards, or concerning great and terrible monsters or legendary heroes. Some of the most enduring Irish legends concern a bishop who lived in the early Christian era, a man known to us today as St. Patrick. Hundreds of Christian saints have feast days in their name, but St. Patrick's Day on March 17th is one of the few that's well known outside of the saint's native land and commemorated by Christians and non-Christians alike. With St. Patrick's Day upon us, I thought I'd take a look at some of the best known Irish legends and see if I could trace their origins in history, or at least come up with explanations for some of their more intriguing attributes and learn more about the history behind the myths. Whether he's hawking cereal or stalking Jennifer Aniston, the Leprechaun is one of the most recognizable fantasy creatures stemming from Irish folklore. The list of small and mischievous fey creatures is a long one, and attempting to trace the precise origins of any of them would have you delving deep into stories likely told around hearth fires long before anything was written down. What we do know is that the earliest written reference to leprechauns comes from the Irish tale The Saga of Fergus MacLetty, written in the 8th century. In that story, Fergus, the King of Ulster, falls asleep on a beach when three tiny sprites come along and try to drag him into the ocean. He awakens and captures them and forces them to grant him three wishes. None of them, though, are for a pot of gold. In fact, the legend of leprechauns hiding a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow might have something to do with the Vikings. They started raiding the British Isles, including Ireland, around the same time as the story about Fergus was recorded, and they sometimes buried treasure in hidden locations, so when some of it was found, it might have been attributed to fairy creatures like leprechauns. As for the rainbow part of things, while well, rainbows are circles and don't actually have ends, so saying treasure or anything else amazing can be found at the end of a rainbow is akin to saying you'll come across it when pigs fly or when hell freezes over. It's meant to highlight the elusiveness of leprechauns and the futility of pursuing them and searching for their treasure. You might as well buy a lottery ticket. There is one way to catch a leprechaun, however. According to D.R. McCannelly's 1888 book Irish Wonders, when a leprechaun wears out his shoes by running and stops to mend them, that's your chance. When a leprechaun gets lazy, though, he might take advantage of your farm animals. In Clare and Galway, the favorite amusement of the leprechaun is riding a sheep or goat, or even a dog, when the other animals are not available, and if the sheep look weary in the morning or the dog is muddy and worn out with fatigue, the peasant understands that the local leprechaun has been going on some errand that lay at a greater distance than he cared to travel on foot. So the next time your dog is looking tired and run down, blame a leprechaun and cut the poor fellow some slack. The Banshee is a spirit that takes the form of a ghostly woman and is known for her high-pitched screaming or wailing. Banshees were often seen as heralds of doom, singing their tragic melodies in advance of a family member's death, or bringing news of a distant relative's recent demise. In the former sense, the Banshee would have been perceived as hostile and probably taken the form of a monstrous elderly hag, while the latter type, a helpful Banshee, might have been seen as a beautiful young woman. The Banshee's origins probably lie with Keening, a kind of vocal lament for the deceased native to the Celtic peoples of Ireland and Scotland and dating back to at least the 7th century. Women were hired to perform these songs at funerals, and they were paid with alcohol. This made them sinners in the eyes of the church, and led them down a messy life path which resulted in many of them becoming the kinds of elderly crones that we associate with the popular image of the Banshee. It's said that the more important the person, the more Banshees will manifest to wail when that person dies. This also checks out with the notion of paid keeners, since the wealthy and powerful would have been able to afford more of them to attend their funerals. So, if you're looking for a way to spice up your funeral, put it in your will that you want some professional banshees to perform. It's not like you'll have to listen to them. The Hour Attack is a vampire from Ireland that, like the better known Vlad the Impaler aka Dracula, may have been based on a real person. In fact, Dracula may have been based on him. We'll get to that in a minute. There are a few different legends surrounding the Hour Attack, but all portray him as a great villain who wouldn't stay dead no matter how many times a heroic warrior slew him and buried him. Exactly how he was finally defeated depends on the story. In one of them, the Hour Attack was a petty tyrant who lived about 1500 years ago and returned from the grave every night to drink the blood of his subjects no matter how often the hero Kahuan slew him. Kahuan consulted a Catholic priest who advised that the next time he killed Hour Attack he should drive a sword of yew wood through his heart 
bury him upside down, and place a heavy stone upon the grave. That seemed to work, and our attack never rose again. In fact, you can still see the stone that Kaihuan supposedly used to keep the vampire underground in Northern Ireland, at a site called Sly de Verity Dolmen. According to an article by David Dale on HistoryIreland.com, in 1997 workers attempted to cut down the tree at the site, only to have their new chainsaws fail on three occasions, once cutting the hand of a worker, and soaking the ground with blood. Dale himself said that he, quote, suffered a severe and inexplicable fall after visiting the site. That's all well and good. Well, actually, it's pretty horrifying, but you get what I mean. But other than some similarities in character, what does an Irish vampire legend from the 6th century have to do with the literary Dracula or his inspiration, Vlad the Impaler? Historian Elizabeth Miller studied Dracula and Bram Stoker for 25 years, even consulting the author's working notes on the novel. She said that at no point, either in those notes or in the novel itself, did Stoker mention Impaling or even the name Vlad. While Stoker had some knowledge of the distant Wallachian prince, Miller reasoned that he had already started writing his novel before coming across accounts of the historical Vlad, and simply thought Dracula, which means devil in modern Romanian, sounded like a great name for a villain in a horror novel. Following up on her work is author Bob Curran, who's written several books about vampires and other mythological creatures. He points out that Stoker, who was born in Dublin, Ireland, would have been familiar with the Auratok myth and may have used it as the basis for his Dracula character before he had ever heard of the Prince of Wallachia. Unless we find more of Bram Stoker's notes, we'll probably never know his exact inspiration. So don't worry, my Romanian friends. You are unlikely to see Dracula cavorting with leprechauns anytime soon. Finally, let's talk about the man himself. The real St. Patrick was a Christian bishop and missionary who lived during the 5th century. Some of his writings have actually survived to the modern day, and one of his works, St. Patrick's Confession, gives us a large number of biographical details. My name is Patrick. I am a sinner, a simple country person, and the least of all believers. I am looked down upon by many. My father was Calpurnius. He was a deacon. His father was Potitus, a priest, who lived at Banavan Tabernay. His home was near there, and that is where I was taken prisoner. I was about 16 at the time. At that time, I did not know the true God. I was taken into captivity in Ireland along with thousands of others. We deserved this because we had gone away from God and did not keep his commandments. St. Patrick goes on to give a detailed account of his early life in Ireland, saying that he tended sheep for six years upon his arrival. He then said that a voice in the night told him that a ship was ready to transport him back to his native country, but that it was 200 miles away. He abandoned his slave master and made for the distant place. The captain of the ship, who was a pagan, initially refused to allow Patrick aboard, but some of the other men on the ship invited him anyway. They made landfall three days after setting out, and spent another 28 days traveling through wilderness. When their food supplies ran out, the captain taunted Patrick. What about this, Christian? You tell us that your god is great and all-powerful? Why can't you pray for us since we're in a bad state with hunger? There's no sign of us finding a human being anywhere. Patrick responded to the captain and told his men to turn in faith with all your hearts to the Lord my God, because nothing is impossible for him so that he may put food in your way, even enough to make you fully satisfied. He has an abundance everywhere. As soon as he said that, a herd of pigs suddenly appeared before them. They fed on their meat for two days, after which the men, quote, gave the greatest of thanks to God. Patrick returned to his parents in Britain, but a few years later received a letter from Ireland and experienced the voice of God on several occasions, which led him to return to Ireland and become a missionary spreading Christianity to its pagan population. It wasn't easy. Patrick said that he gave out not less than the price of 15 persons to various authorities, and that he gave gifts to kings, who imprisoned him and his companions. I live for my God to teach these peoples, even if I am despised by some, he said. His other surviving document is the letter to the soldiers of Caroticus, in which he calls upon his readers to ostracize Caroticus and his men who had cruelly slain and sacrificed by the sword some newly baptized Christians and seized their wealth. St. Patrick said that he baptized thousands of people during his long life, but what about his most famous legend, that of banishing snakes from Ireland? Unfortunately, that one is just an invention. Ireland was snake-free for millennia before Patrick's arrival, going all the way back to the Ice Age. And the first mention of St. Patrick ridding the land of serpents comes from the 12th century, some 700 years after his death. Snakes are notable anti-Christian symbols appearing in the Bible and the stories of Adam and Eve and of Moses, so it's no surprise that they would also feature in stories about Ireland's most famous saint. Maybe the root of the legend equates pagans with snakes, 
and credits St. Patrick with driving out or converting evil people rather than literal serpents. In any case, remember what I said about keeners being considered sinners by the church because they were paid in alcohol? If you're planning to get smashed this St. Patrick's Day, keep in mind that St. Patrick himself would probably disapprove. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video exploring the real life history of Irish myths. If you did, please like and subscribe and leave a comment to let me know what other kinds of myths you'd like me to look into in a future video. Until next time, have a safe and happy St. Patrick's Day.